What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here and I have a book that I want to talk to you about. The Walt Simonson Thor Visionaries Volume 4. This collects the four issue Baldur the Brave miniseries and Thor 371 through 374. Now if you have this particular printing of this book, on the back it says that it collects 371 through 373. That is a typo. It actually collects 374 also. So if you were looking online and you were looking to see uh, which issues are collected in the Thor Visionaries from Walt Simonson and you're disappointed that this one skips 374, it does uh, that's just a typo at the back of the book. So uh, basically, uh, in my review of Volume 3, I complained that uh, it kept referencing the Baldur the Brave miniseries. It referenced it like three or four times in the events of the comics that were collected in that volume. And I complained that, okay, it keeps referencing that miniseries, but we don't see it in that book. And then it's collected here. And I think I know why they waited and collected it here instead of trying to collect at least some of that miniseries in Volume 3. It's because uh, Volume 3 is kind of the end of Walt Simonson doing the art on this run. He's still writing this run, uh, but up until this point, he was writing and drawing. Now, uh, Sal Buscema is actually drawing uh, Thor for him, and uh, Sal Buscema is also the one who is drawing the Baldur the Brave miniseries. So, I get the feeling they wanted to uh, kind of collect the Baldur the Brave miniseries at the same time uh, that they started collecting uh, the point in the book where Sal Buscema started drawing, so that, uh, artistically speaking, this book would be consistent. Uh, I get that. It's still not great that in Volume 3, if you're reading Volume 3 and you don't have Volume 4 yet, and they keep referencing the Baldur the Brave miniseries, which you haven't read yet. Uh, that's still a little bit of a problem, but I at least understand why they did that this time. Uh, so, uh, first I'll talk about the Baldur the Brave miniseries. Uh, it's pretty good. I really like it. Uh, I found that Baldur is one of my favorite characters from this run. I really like uh, the dichotomy going on with this character. He's a really good warrior, but at the same time he's a pacifist, uh, because uh, any warrior that he's killed, he has to live with that, and not only live with the fact that he has ended a life, but he's gone to the underworld, the Norse underworld, at least twice, I think, uh, as of the end of this volume, he's gone twice, and also if you've read volume three, you know that he went uh, with Thor and his friends. Um, he's gone to the underworld, and he sees, oh, okay, these guys that I killed, uh, things are not good for them down here. Uh, things are really bad, and I'm kind of responsible for their lives, as it is, in this place, being so tormented. And so, uh, that kind of forces him, doesn't really force him, uh, he becomes a pacifist because of that. And he's willing to uh, go into adventure and go to action, but he doesn't want to fight or kill people. And yet, he's still a really good warrior, and he's very compassionate, and he's very kind-hearted, and he's probably one of my favorite characters in this entire book. And, and it's not that he's just a 100% pure uh, do-gooder. Uh, he's got a little bit of darkness in him, but not like a dark, broody, uh, gothic poet guy that you went to high school with. Not like that. He has darkness in him because he's done dark things and he has to live with that, but he's choosing to see uh, the better or he's choosing to make the best of what he has. And I feel like that's a very inspirational thing for any character to do. Uh, Baldur is a very inspirational kind of character, uh, but he's also, he feels very real. He's not 100% good and noble and therefore kind of boring. Uh, he's got a little bit of darkness to him that makes him feel a little bit more realistic. Uh, and I really like uh, this miniseries with the exception of the first issue. Uh, the first issue is weird uh, because basically it it just exists to set up this magic sword that Carnilla the Norn Queen has, and then that sword is going to play into uh, the story of the last three issues. But that first issue is set uh, before Baldur goes to the underworld with Thor and uh, that army that were going to rescue the souls of the mortal men. And then uh, the second, third, and fourth issue are set after that. And while Baldur is gone, uh, Carnilla is kidnapped by frost giants, and then Baldur and Agnar, who is also from Simonson's Thor run, uh, he's basically sort of a squire to Baldur. Uh, he was this really hot-headed, angry guy who wanted to have a fight with Baldur just to improve his own reputation. And then uh, now he kind of respects Baldur, and, res and Baldur respects him as well. Uh, he and Baldur are basically going into the Frost Giant territory to rescue Carnilla. And uh, I really like that plot. It's very simple. It's down to earth. Uh, but it does a lot of good stuff with the characters, all the characters. Uh, Baldur, uh, Agnar, and Carnilla, they all go through some really good changes in this, uh, especially Carnilla. Uh, I was really surprised to see her uh, go through some maturity throughout this four-issue miniseries, and uh, that was uh, a little bit heartbreaking, but also very interesting to see, and I wasn't expecting to see that from her. Uh, so uh, I really like that Baldur four-issue miniseries. Uh, the only thing I didn't like was that 
it really feels like the plot is only happening in the last three issues of it, and the first issue is kind of just setting up uh, this magic sword that is going to play into the next three issues. Um, so it almost feels like it could have just been a three-issue mini, but that's really my only complaint about that miniseries. And then uh, the rest of this book, uh, Thor 371 through 374, uh, we get a brief two-issue story with this character called the Zaniac being uh, broken out of prison, and uh, I don't know anything about the Zaniac. He sounds like a really awful Thor character who appeared one time in the 1960s and then was almost forgotten and then he's broken out of prison and then basically uh, when he is killed uh, there are all these demon rat creatures that come out of his body and they will jump onto someone else and kind of carry on the legacy of the Zaniac into someone else. A uh, very very strange concept here and basically uh, there's this guy from the future who is more or less Judge Dredd uh, in everything but name only. He comes to the past to try and stop Zaniac from causing World War 7 and uh, basically he and Thor uh, they they get into a little bit of a scuffle, and then they team up, and uh, the Zaniac, he goes and kills Jane Foster, and then Thor and uh, Judge Dredd, they go back in time 24 hours, and they kill the Zaniac before uh, he can kill Jane Foster, and then uh, the day is saved thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Uh, Jane Foster shows up in this book for all of two pages. Uh, she's pregnant, and she's married to some dude named Keith. Uh, I don't know anything about that, because by the time you get to the J. Michael Straczynski Thor run, uh, she's no longer uh, with Keith, I don't think, and we don't see or hear anything about the baby that she had. So I don't know what happened to all of that. Uh, I may or may not find out because I've got some more Thor books to read after this one. But uh, I just thought that was worth mentioning that Jane Foster, uh, during the Walt Simonson run, really wasn't a main character at all in this run. In fact, uh, I think throughout the entire run, she only appears in two pages in this book. Uh, and now she's much more of a major character in the Thor mythos. And uh, I don't know what happened to her baby or her husband. But uh, after that two-issue story, we have another two-issue story uh, that ties in with the Mutant Master that was going on with the X-Men books. And uh, if you haven't read The Mutant Massacre, if you're just interested in Thor, uh, these two issues pretty much stand on their own. The only thing that you need to know is that there was a mutant massacre going on in the tunnels beneath New York City. And uh, Thor, uh, he finds out about it, and it's not really a contrived way that he finds out about it. It works. Uh, he finds out from a couple of frogs, and as you mentioned, uh, as you know from Volume 3, uh, Thor was briefly a frog, and he uh, befriended uh, the frog community in New York City, and so a couple of frogs come and tell him, hey, this is what's going on underneath uh, the city. And so Thor goes down there, and uh, he meets a couple of members of X-Factor, and he fights a couple of the Marauders, and uh, it's a fine little uh, two-part story. Uh, it doesn't really require that you read all of the X-Men or X-Factor portions of this crossover. Basically, all you have to know is that there is a big massacre going on beneath the city of the Morlock community. Uh, and if you haven't read the Thor issues, if you've only read the X-Factor and X-Men issues, uh, there is something that happens uh, in this book, uh, Thor, uh, he basically uh, creates this huge raging fire to kind of destroy all the dead bodies, uh, basically to cleanse the tunnel so that uh, they don't start rotting and then disease starts spreading and uh, goes up to the city and starts infecting the people up in the city. Uh, Thor burns all of these bodies, basically uh, for sanitation's sake. And then later on in, uh, I think it was Uncanny X-Men, uh, Callisto, who survived the massacre, she comes back and it's like her entire home has been destroyed by a fire and she doesn't know what happened there. And if you were reading Uncanny X-Men and not Thor, uh, you might be a little confused. Where did this fire come from? Uh, it came from here. Uh, so basically, uh, there's not a whole lot going on in the Thor section of this book. Uh, two short stories, one where Thor fights the Zaniac with Judge Dredd from the future, uh, the other one where Thor uh, is kind of embroiled in the mutant massacre. And uh, meanwhile, Baldur the Brave, he brings uh, the raven Hunnin or Huggin. Uh, there's Muggin and Huggin, I think, or Huggin and Munnin. Uh, I'm trying to remember their names. Uh, it's something like that. I think it's Huggin and Munnin. Uh, two ravens that belong to Odin, and one of them died, like, at the very end of Volume 1 of this run, uh, and then Baldur brings that raven back to life, and that's basically all that happens. Uh, and it may sound like I didn't really like this book, because uh, there's not a whole lot that happened in the last four issues of this book, but I actually really enjoyed it, mainly because of the Baldur the Brave miniseries. I thought that was a really fun story that did a lot of good stuff with the characters. Uh, it really showcased these characters and it made them work in ways that, at least with Carnella, uh, Carnilla, I wasn't really interested in that character before, and I like her a lot more because of what this miniseries does with her. And I would be very curious to see how she's handled in comics set after this miniseries. If other writers kind of write her the way that she was written before, or if they write her with a little more uh, maturity that she has at the end of this miniseries. And uh, the other four issues of Thor here, they're not bad. Uh, they're fun little issues, but there's also just not a whole lot going on there. Uh, I would say, I have said before, that... Uh, 
uh, Walt Simonson's run uh, is overall accepted by everyone as being like the best Thor run period. Uh, but I still feel like, uh, even though I thought this volume was okay and it wasn't bad or anything like that, I still feel like uh, they really, uh, this run kind of peaked uh, at the end of the part where uh, everyone was fighting Surtur. When uh, Loki was teaming up with Thor and Odin and everybody, and they were all fighting Surtur, uh, right at the end of Volume 2, uh, if you have the trade paperbacks, uh, right at the end of Volume 2, I think is where uh, this run kind of peaked. And then after that, uh, we get some pretty decent stories, like in Volume 3, where they go to the underworld uh, to rescue the mortal souls from Hell or Hela. Uh, and then uh, in this volume, uh, we get uh, some nice, short, quiet stories. Uh, there's nothing bad with these stories, but uh, it feels like uh, you had this really epic, really huge battle at the end of Volume 2, and you did have that huge epic battle, and they were building up to it since the very beginning of this run, and then after that, it's like, okay, now let's do some quiet, small stories, some character building stories, and it's good to do character building stories, but it almost feels like they had this huge series finale going on at the end of Volume 2, and then after that, they kept going for another three volumes. Um, I, I don't have a problem with these volumes. I like this volume, and I like Volume 3 for the most part, but uh, I do feel like this run kind of peaked at the end of Volume 2 when they were fighting Sir Tur. Uh, so those are my thoughts on the Thor, Walt Simonson, Visionaries, Volume 4. Uh, I hope that you guys like this video. Uh, if you've read this book, tell me about it in the comments below. Let me know what you thought of it. And if you liked this video, uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And I will be back later in the week with some other videos and also next week I'll have some videos for you. So uh, be sure to check those out in the future. In the meantime, you guys have a great rest of your day. Catch you later.